wrestling fans. This episode is brought to you by Spartan Combat. They're now accepting custom team apparel orders for the 2022-2023 season, which will be here before you know it. Go to SpartanCombat.com to place your custom team apparel orders. Now let's get to this episode with Coach Luke Fickle. I know for a fact that, that uh, I would not be where I am if in several playing football and you know have an opportunity to play at the next level had I not been a wrestler. We can endure anything and adapt and pivot and change. Wrestling gave us that ability. I would say nothing in life has impacted me more than the things wrestling has taught me in terms of self-reflection, resilience. Toughness. Some guys have it, some guys don't. Adversity, 100%. How to pick myself up and be a man after I failed. And everything that has shaped my life and where I'm at today would not be there without the values and basically the, the lessons I've learned through the sport of wrestling. For me, wrestling saved my life because it, it allowed me to focus and channel my energy. We're fortunate if you wrestled because if you wrestled, natural talent helps, but it's, it's 5% of the ingredient. It pales in comparison to heart and technique and effort. It humbled me, taught me humility. Nothing can hit, humble you more than wrestling. I think it's the learning to adapt, right? You learn, you learn how to adapt, you learn how to solve problems. You know, if I look back at my time, that's good wrestling. If it gave me one thing more than anything else, it's mental toughness. Welcome to the Wrestling Changed My Life podcast. This is your host, Ryan Warner. As always, we're presented by Spartan Combat. This episode is with the University of Cincinnati head coach, head football coach, that is, Luke Fickle. Coach Fickle was the coach of the year last year, and his football team went all the way to the college football playoffs before losing to Alabama in the semis. Back in high school, Coach Fickle was one of the top prospects to come out of Ohio during his era. He was a three-time state champ and had a 106-0 record his final three years of high school. There is so much gold in this interview about team building, leadership, culture building. It was an honor to have Coach on the podcast, and I can't wait for you to hear this interview. Fan of the Week goes to Brandon Kane, Communications Director for Beat the Streets. That's Brandon M. Kane on Twitter. Thank you for tuning into the show during your morning runs. We greatly appreciate it. And without further ado, folks, let's give it up for Coach Luke Fickle. Coach Fickle, welcome to the podcast. It's an honor to have you. Oh, no, I appreciate it. I've uh, I've listened to uh, you know several of your your podcasts and uh, always been intrigued by them. That is uh, very humbling, and, and thank you for listening. I wanted to start this one at one of the I'm guessing probably the biggest junctures in your life. You are in Wisconsin at a training camp for the Saints. You blow your knee out and you're in the hospital and you have to have a conversation with yourself about what you're going to do. What happened and how did that lead to a, to a coaching you got Ohio state? Uh, well, I, I, uh, the realization of, of at some point in time, your, your playing careers come to an end. And I think that's when, uh, that's when I didn't know it was over, but you know, in my mind was the first time where there was like, Oh boy, this plan B thing that, you had always talked about, about going back to school and going to medical school. I'm not sure that's really what, uh, that I really want to do. And, um, it just kind of made me reflect back on all the people that I had so much respect for and, and, and got me to where I am outside of my family. Um, you know, it was all my coaches and, uh, all the way back to my own uncle, who was my wrestling coach to my high school wrestling coach to my little league wrestling coach to my high school football. I mean, just all the people wrestling being first and foremost, the, the coaches that you know had an incredible effect. And then all the way through. And uh, when I kind of decided like, Oh my goodness, I didn't realize, you know, what these coaches have all meant to me. And uh, if, and when this thing ends, I think this is the route I want to go. And had you thought about coaching a lot when you were at Ohio state playing? No, no, it's actually funny. Cause my best friend college roommate for four years is Mike Brabel. And, um, Obviously, he's the head coach of the Tennessee Titans. And and he used to always say, I'm going to be a coach. His dad was a high school basketball coach. He's like, I'm going to be a coach when I'm done. And I was always like, that's crazy. I'm not being a coach. I'm, you know, never even thought about it. And uh, it's amazing that all of a sudden when that 
kind of hit that moment when, uh, you know, it looked like there was a good chance that that competitive career, that uh, playing career of some sort was going to come to a, to an end um, of how all those things kind of just came back and, and our conversations that me and, you know, my college roommate had had and, and you know, it was, it was kind of unique. And then you'd, you'd take the, is it the GA job at Ohio State to get things going? I do actually, I go back and I rehab there for, uh, for about six months, seven months, trying to see if there still is any, any, any hope or any opportunity. So during that time of rehabbing is when I started to, you know, so to speak, be a GA. I wasn't really a GA. I was rehabbing for most of the morning. And then I would, you know, be with the coaches and go out to practice and do all that. And, uh, that's when all of a sudden it became one of those things was like, wow, this is my old coach started talking to me about, Hey, would you want to be a GA? And, you know, um, I said, sure, this is, this is the route I want to go. And, and, uh, it all kind of snowballed from there. And like, what a, what an amazing career you got to work with some legendary coaches, Trussell, coach Meyer, um, big fan of both of those guys. And, you know, as you work through your coaching ladder, I've heard you reference in a couple interviews that wrestling, that mentality has kind of been with you the whole time. Take us back to, uh, to how you got started wrestling. <laughs> well, it's hard for me to even remember back to, you know, four or five years old. Cause that's when I started. And, um, you know, my, like I said, my uncle was a high school wrestling coach and, and my dad helped him out a bit too. And so I started off in, in what we called the little stallions program out of, out of my high school, um, the sales high school in Columbus. And I think, I, like I said, I think I was five years old and my dad was helping do some of the coaching in there. So I think it was, it was a, you know, a part-time babysitting as long as well as, uh, you know, getting smacked around a little bit. And um, I think I always, the joke is for the first three, two or three years, I didn't win a match. I never had wrestling <laughs> shoes. Uh, I never won a match until, until I got wrestling shoes. Then I think after like year two or three, I, I they say I won a match, but uh it didn't bother me. I, I got to go to the concession stand after getting getting pinned every time, and uh, you know, I think uh, I was happy. And then, when did you get serious about it? Well, I, I think it's. It, it, I make the joke that that I never won, I, and I didn't. But I don't think there was a lot of young kids. Like the the youngest age group was eight, you know, so it was probably eight and under, and you're five. So, you know, I think that uh, you were you know wrestling against older kids, and I, I can't really tell you like. I would say, I know this in kindergarten, I was the mat, you know, kind of the water boy for my high, for my uncle's high school wrestling team, and and I watched a guy named Mark Zimmer uh, win his fourth state title. I think it was in 1980. Uh, he was the first ever Ohio high school four-time state champion. Um, I watched him win his fourth state title at what ended up being my high school, uh, and that's when I made a made my mind up that that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to win the stage four times. And uh, I think I'd say maybe I started to get more serious then. I, I don't know. I mean, my family was into it. Um, I think I started to get a little bit better and, and pretty decent. So I think, uh, I think the, the interest grew, I think, as I got better at it, I would imagine. Yeah. And then in high school, you were a three-time state champ. Your last three years, you didn't lose. Is it true you wrestled the great Kevin Randleman during that career, or was that like a summer <laughs> match? No, no, he's one of my losses as a freshman. Oh, and, uh, really? I, can, I, I remember. It. Yeah, semifinals of the of the Brexville Holiday Wrestling Tournament, um, and uh, Kevin Randleman was a senior at Sandusky High School, and you know, one six wrestling one hundred sixty pounds, and I remember watching. I'm like, I don't know how good he is. He's obviously he's big and strong, and and. Uh, I said, but I'm not sure, you know, I've been wrestling since I'm fine. I'm okay. And, uh, I don't know if this is how it went. This is how I remember it. Obviously God rest his soul. He can't, he's not there to dispute it. Um, I, I think I went out and I took a shot and took him down. And I think all that did was make him really, really mad. <laughs> and from then on, he, he knocked me around the mat. I don't even know what it ended up. I'm sure it was ugly. Um, but I, I don't think I touched his leg or, or had any chance of scoring a point after that. But, um, yeah, that was one of my three or four losses, uh, in high school. I mean, you talk about an absolute specimen, Kevin Random, and my God, was he that, oh, was he that scary he back then? You know what he was? I mean, he was just an incredible athlete. I think as, as he left and then went to the next level, um, obviously he was a, you know, national runner up as a freshman, then won it as a sophomore and junior, um, 
I think he really developed the wrestling skills, but he was just such a unique athlete that I don't know that, you know, we don't maybe see as many really, really, or didn't see as many incredible, incredibly athletic guys, I think at that time. And, and he, so he was a, he was ahead of his game as far as, as, a, as an athlete. And as he became a great wrestler, um, he just took it to the next level. Yeah. And then I don't know if he would have been there when you were at Ohio state, but you, when you initially went to Ohio state, you were going to wrestle and play football. <laughs> yeah, no, he was there. He was okay. there. And uh, yeah, I, I was, you know, obviously friends with him and hung out with those guys and, and worked out with those guys. And, and uh, that was, that was, I think his junior year that he won the, the NCAA. Cause I think he had redshirted as a, as a freshman at Ohio state. Then he took second then won it and won it. Um, so yeah, he was around that, that whole crew of Mark Coleman and those guys um, were all around there. And I have a pretty good idea of like what the jump is from like high school to college wrestling, just from interviewing all these guys. But I'm just curious, what was the jump like in training and physicality when you went from high school football to playing football for Ohio state? Everything is such a unique jump. I mean, the intensity to what you're doing, uh, the level of competition, I think no matter what, whether it's football or wrestling, I think that's the thing that I love. The reason I love to still watch is just it, the competition level is so high and, and, you know, the margin is so small. I think you see it more in individual sports like wrestling than you do in team sports like football. Um, but there's just such a, there's another level and it's, it's, it's everything. It's not just athleticism. It's just size, speed, and it's just intelligence and all that they're doing. And, you know, I think that's where a lot of, you know, people kind of, you know, fall off. It's not an ability it's in, you know, recognizing how competitive it's going to get because the abilities get so much tighter that it becomes a lot of the little things that, that really separate people as they, as they get better. And how long did you uh, do both sports for at Ohio state? Well, as a freshman, uh, I went over and wrestled with him a little bit, but I didn't feel like I, I could leave football. Um, you know, I just, it was, it was hard. It was like, I, you know, I, you're looking at your coaches, like I'm going to go do this. And I don't think they were, you know, really excited about it. Cause they were, you know, curious what this young kid was going to be able to do. And cause I had played a little bit as a true freshman. Um, so I, I only, I worked out a few times with him in my first year, but then after going into my second year, um, is when I say, okay, I'm going to give this a shot. And my football, co- all of them were good. I, you know, I was fortunate enough to, to play that whole year, start uh, at nose guard. And then, um, and then obviously started to, I say dabble, you can't really dabble in the sport of wrestling, but I started to dabble about, uh, I think maybe about January 8th or something, 10th after we got back from a bowl game. That is a, that's a tough time to come into the season, but maybe the one thing you had was that you were fresh because that's when that, that big 10 grind starts to kick in and people are just, they're hurting by January. Um, but yeah, that's just incredible. You were that passionate about wrestling that you thought about and tried doing both for a little bit before you switched to football full time. Yeah, no, I, and, and it was wrestling has always been my love. It, it has been the first love is like I said, from the time I was in kindergarten, um, I decided I wanted to be a four-time state champion. And then as I grew, I, you know, all my goals were all to, you know, win an NCAA title and, and win a Olympic gold medal. And, uh, I never really, you know, talked about football and, and playing at the next level or an NFL or anything like that. It was pretty much all, uh, all wrestling driven as, as a young kid. And I know your brother went on to wrestle at Penn. You decided to talk to me for go wrestling and go heads down to football. And I know this is a wrestling podcast and we can talk wrestling stories, but I am very interested in uh, some of your philosophies on coaching and, and leadership. And I thought maybe we could just start that kind of talk track with 2011, when you were named the interim head coach, you did that for a year. And then ultimately you became the head coach at Cincinnati years later. What's something you take from that year as an interim head coach at Ohio state that you still take with you today? Well, there's so many things. I mean, we could do, hours and hours about the mistakes and the things that, uh, that I had, uh, I'd say the good fortune. I didn't think about that at the time, but, um, some of the good fortunes of learning in a, in an eight month period. So, um, you know, it was about eight months that I was kind of, you know, at the head of the ship. And, uh, you know, I think it starts off first and foremost, I, I, I didn't understand how to be able to delegate 
and I think more than anything as a as a leader and being somebody in charge um, understand that you have to trust others to be able to do things because you can't you can't do them all yourself you can't be at least I couldn't be one of those guys that was trying to oversee and look and do every little thing because when it came down to it I was so wore out I couldn't do the job that I actually needed to do to have the energy um, you know, to lead and guide 18 to 22 year olds every day when you walk in there, I had just gotten so drained um, from trying to be a part of every single thing because I because I didn't know what I didn't know. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think first and foremost that year taught me more than anything is, wow, you you've got to trust the people that are around you. You're going to have to put some really good people around you um, because if if you don't, there's no way that uh, you can really get done what you need to get done. And it's crazy that just within eight months of being a head coach, you were already starting to feel some of those, those not, I want to say burnout, but pressures and just exhaustion of running basically a, you know, a fortune fortune 100 company. Uh, but just in eight months, so you were feeling that. Yeah. I mean, it, it, and I, I know that, you know, that was a, that was big for me as I started here. Um, not that I didn't have people that you try. I mean, obviously I was, you know, at that point in time working with, the guys I'd been working with for a long time, but it was the big thing for me when I, when I had the opportunity to come here to Cincinnati from the get go, starting, it was like, I have just, you've got to have, I've got to have the people that are around me that, you know, that you, you have some connection with that you can trust because you do, you've got to be able to, you know, every single day walk in with that energy and, and it can get draining. And uh, you know, in the sport of football, you got 120, 115 kids, whatever it is, but the, 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 you know, the size of things uh, enough can, uh, can wear you down. So, um, you know, I would never say that I was wore out because, you know, us wrestlers, the last thing we're ever going to do is show any weakness, <laughs> right. you know, as soon as somebody, so I, I tell my kids that all the time, as soon as they see you all of a sudden start to bend over and like your work, they're coming after you. But the mental side of things that, that I didn't recognize, you know, that, that I didn't have the energy. I thought I did, but as I look back at it, I was like, wow, I, I didn't have the energy um, because of all the other things were running through my head. So delegating that's, and that's such a, uh, you know, for wrestlers, uh, something that sometimes you snuff at, right? Like my day job, I'm an enterprise sales. That's one of the number one things early on where people would be like, you know, let this guy help, let this guy help, you know, that they can do this, yep. but it's so hard to let go of the reins when you're, when you're trying to take it to the very top. Yeah. And it was for that one was a unique time. And uh, so that would be the first thing. The second thing that jumps out at me always is um, being who you are. And, and it sounds kind of cliche, but I took over at a time where, okay, I had to make a decision. You know, there was a lot of turmoil going on. Um, you know, I, I didn't know what our kids could handle and I didn't know what our coaching staff could handle. So in my mind, I made a conscious decision that I needed to do everything like coach Trestle had been doing them that I could to try to limit all the different changes, you know, cause we're different people, you know, I love mm-hmm. coach Tress and I, I mean, I worked with him for him for 10 years. Um, and, and we are, we're different people. I'm, I'm an emotional guy. I wear my emotions on my sleeve. Coach Tress is the most level headed, even keeled, you know, never let you see his emotions in, in, in any way. And I felt like, I needed to be like him and do it like him because that's what had worked. And that's what I thought those guys needed. I mean, more of the players. And that's another one of those things that just wore me out because I couldn't be myself. You know, I was trying to be somebody in some way that I wasn't because I thought that's what was best for our team and our program. And, and uh, I failed miserably at that. And uh, I, I kind of recognized that about three quarters of the way through, but there was not a whole lot that I could do, um, but mm-hmm. that's something that has stuck with me and, and um, any leadership opportunity or role that I've ever, you know, from that point on, ever had a chance to walk into. Uh, I always remind you, first and foremost, you've got it because you can't be consistent um, if you're not yourself. You can't be authentic if you're not yourself. And if you're not authentic, you're not consistent. You're not going to be able to motivate. And to me, those are the three most important things. Wow. That's awesome. And you, I've heard you say the consistency is so key and it's like, 
you 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 tell recruits like I know you love football, but do you love it at two a.m. or six a.m. on Tuesday? And uh, it's just so true, right? I mean, anyone can be excited at the beginning of a new job or at the beginning of a season, but really in the trenches is where it counts. There's no doubt. I mean, the, the hallmark to anything great, uh, if you're going to be successful, going to be great at anything, has got to be consistency. And uh, no matter what it is, there's going to be those waves of ups and downs. And if you can't find a way to be consistent in, you know, in what you're doing, and, and I mean that as a leader, uh, as much as anything. Um, so consistency yeah. has been up into my head since uh, since I started, especially with Coach Tressel. And when you you were on at Ohio State for another, you know, four or five years under Coach Meyer, what's something you picked up from him and, and just those amazing runs you guys had during that era? One of the greatest motivators I've ever been around. And um, so I was very fortunate in my coaching career in, in football. I, I was a GA for um, John Cooper at Ohio State. So I played for Coach Cooper and then was a GA for him. He's a Hall of Fame, college Hall of Fame. Uh, football coach then I obviously coached with coach Tressel and he's a, obviously a college football hall of fame guy too and then coach Meyer will be a college football hall of fame so three unique guys obviously phenomenal at what they do all three different leadership styles so the, the thing about coach Meyer I mean there's nobody that's a greater motivator uh, his whole philosophy is on edge so he's always pushing um, he's always driving he's always motivating and 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 whether it's his staff or whether it's his players. And I think that um, for me with that, that's, you know, the greatest thing that I took from him in a five-year period that, you know, that consistency, like I said, it's still consistency. You know, it's, it wasn't like one day he was a motivator and the next day he was kind of laid back. It was the constant motivation uh, all the time. That sounds like Coach Gable almost. I could say get in there a guy's skin with one word and just walk away. I would say, you know, obviously listening, I, I followed Coach Gable. I read all the books. I've, uh, you know, he was my, obviously my idol as a, as a kid. Um, and uh, I, I would say that that would probably be very similar. I, I didn't know Coach Gable. Obviously, I never got to wrestle for him or never got to go to any of the, the camps like I always wanted to. Um, but I would picture that that's probably more similar to what Coach Meyer would be as far as that on edge, every day, pushing, driving, <laughs> motivating. In, in, in their own way. Obviously, Coach Trail, all great coaches motivate in, you know, in different ways. But uh, emotional, the, the, the on-edge side is definitely, I, I'm sure, was uh, what Coach Myers and I would envision Coach Gable would be very similar. And then when you get to Cincinnati, I heard that you had laid out like a two, a four, and a six-year plan. But I'm, I'm more curious. And like, you know, what was one of the first or second things you did to start changing – the quote unquote coach or start to kind of build, um, build your vision of the program. So I, I was talking about me, you know, there's not much different. I, I try to, you know, model it after how I learned growing up wrestling and things like that. And all we tried to do was about being competitive and, uh, walked in the door here and, you know, um, obviously I had coached for a while and, and obviously been under three hall of fame coaches, but I felt like we walking in the door, we had a change in mindset and we had to really create a, a competitive spirit in everything that we were doing. And uh, I thought we did that. You know, everybody's got this great vision when you walk in. I thought we did that all through the spring. Um, I thought we did that all through fall camp and we go out there and we are an absolutely awful football team. Um, we win four football games in year one. We should have won one some way, somehow three other teams handed us a win some by their mistakes. Um, and, and I and I realized more than anything that we still we had good players. We had such a bad football team because for us there was no trust, respect, and love. And I and I, I realized that right before our last game, and it was like almost like an epiphany. Like I've completely screwed this up. They've come in here, and all we've tried to do is get these guys to compete and work and fight and you know do everything every day. And then I recognized they had they had no concept of who they were, who anybody else was. And inside our locker room, we had no team concept. And um, I guess I could use wrestling a little bit as the, as an excuse, the way I grew up, you know, being a little bit more of an individual sport. That's what I envisioned I needed to do here. And, and I couldn't be as far from wrong 
um, of really how we started. So how did, I mean, that is a, that is big. And I mean, trust, love, and truth. I've heard that with, with other guys who've come on the podcast. So it's no surprise. It's important to you. Um, but how do you start to change that? You know what? We, we, we really just kind of went back to the basics. Like we were in high school, like, you know, if you don't know your teammates, so, so we actually did, we, we went, we did retreats. We did, you know, we mixed up our workout groups. We, we, you know, had dinner sessions where you were eating with different guys. And it, it was, it was more than anything, just, you know, it's, it's what you pound into their heads too. Um, you know, we go away to camp. So we're, we're getting close to, to uh, the start of our camp. We will go away for 18 days together. So we actually go to a, a place just about 45 minutes east of, of our campus out in the woods in Indiana. Uh, and we'll stay for basically 18 days, live in, you know, barracks is in a, in a little lodge. Um, and for us, they had always done that. We had gone out there my first year for like four or five days. And we just felt like this way we, we've got a captive on our guys. There's really not much of any cell service. So they, this whole camp, they spend together and freshman guys live in barracks, sophomores live in other barracks and, and then the upperclassmen live in a, in a crappy little lodge. Um, but it really got us so much closer, we, you know, and we did things where guys had to know each other. So that trust, respect, and love that we felt like I knew we didn't have in year one really grew uh, and a lot of the things that we did, and it's amazing how much it showed on the football field. And like when you're going through that first year, I mean, everything is so great for you and your program now. And I'm sure people are like, oh yeah, it must've always been like that. But I got to imagine during those, that tough first year, what were, I mean, how did you overcome the self doubts and say, man, what, what the heck am I doing here? So there's definitely that. And, uh, <laughs> you know, the unique thing is everybody likes to blame it on the players. You know, ah, we just got to get our own players. You know, not everybody, but at times people want to blame players, the players. And in reality, it was it was the leader. And, uh, you know, so I think it first started off with taking taking ownership. As we look back at it, we, we had some we had four guys make an NFL roster from that team of winning four games, you know. And, and for us, that's pretty good. I mean, one guy drafted, but four guys made it. The following year, we went 11 games. We have one guy drafted, and I think we only had two guys make an NFL roster. So we had better players, but it was just setting the what the environment, atmosphere, and culture was really like, and then leading to it. And and in year one, I just I was off. We were off, and uh, you know I think we we had some things obviously fall in line in, in year two because you know seeing is believing, and and our guys you know won early in that season, and and really started to buy in uh, to a lot of the different things that we were doing. And uh, it just kind of kept rolling and snowballing. And, you know, but, but I can honestly, in this sport of football, if you don't do things together, you can't be successful. And I'm sure even the great ones like coach Gable would tell you, it's an individual sport, but you can't work this hard every day and grind. If you don't have people around you, that you trust, respect, and love, they're going to help push you on those other days. I mean, especially in your world, right, where it's it's so team-based. And, you know, I think a lot of wrestlers, sometimes it's a hindrance not to have that, that team aspect because when you go in, you know, other other facets of life, it is it is really about the team. You know, when you, you guys will go into this camp, it must be an incredible operation to bring your whole team up there and to house and feed everyone for that long. But, you know, every time we get to this fall time of year where, you know, there's going to be a new freshman class of high school, a new freshman class of college. There's going to be new guys playing in the pros. You know, it's so exciting because it's such a make or break point of your life. What's the message you're coming with to the, to the freshmen who are coming into their first college practices? They got, they got to learn that they, they have to understand whatever they think their work capacity, however tough they think they are, however you know, much they think they've worked, they don't have any clue at what the next level looks like. And as long as they understand that, that they're going to learn, it's a journey. Um, I, I try and tell them all the time, toughness is a skill. Everybody's built, born with some different levels of that skill, but it's something that you're going to train and work at. And, you know, so those young guys coming in, 
that all think that they're going to walk in and have a chance to play. The, the reality is that they're going to have to learn. They're going to learn how to work. They're going to learn how to play together. They're going to learn how to depend on the guys that are next to them. If they do that, then they have an opportunity. But um, it's difficult for young guys coming into, you know, not to say good programs, but, you know, programs that are a little bit more established for, for being there, for, you know, having a culture and environment. Um, so it's a little bit tougher. So those guys mentally uh, just have to understand that. Uh, and if they don't and aren't willing to grow, and I don't mean physically, I mean more mentally and emotionally, it, it's it's really challenging. And I think that's why so many kids leave um, right now. And we're making it a little bit easier on them to leave, unfortunately. But I think a lot of it is because, you know, it's just the mental and emotional toughness it takes uh, in a lot of these programs in year one and year two. I love how you said toughness is a skill because that's something I've, I've wondered if that's true or not. Why, why do you think that's, that's true? I, I see kids every year walk in the door here and everybody starts at a different level. You know, yes. I, I love the ones that have come in and wrestle because uh, I would tell you that they're probably on the upper level on the upper end of the, of the toughness scale. Um, but when we talk toughness, we talk mental, physical, and emotional toughness. And I think those are skills that have to be trained. You know, you can be the toughest guy in the world. We're going to find a way to put you in situations that you're not prepared for. And now it's going to challenge you, whether it's physically, whether it's mentally, and whether it's emotionally. And so I think if you don't challenge yourself, if you aren't eventually around people that are going to be better in some categories of that than you, uh, you're not going to grow. And um, so I've seen kids many, many, many of them that, that understand and recognize that and really take their toughness to another level, uh, whether they were, you know, not very tough when they walked in and they walk out. I'm not saying all of a sudden they're the toughest guy in the program, but I promise you uh, their level of toughness, both physically, emotionally, and mentally will grow I, in the three to five years that they are in our program. There's no doubt, or they won't make it. There's no way they'll make it. I mean, I can't even imagine the level you guys are holding your your guides to. And not that the level's any higher now because you're winning, but now it's like, man, there's so much momentum behind the program. Coach, I got three quick rapid fire questions and we'll let you go. Sound good? I, I'm good. Beautiful. And we should say, folks, Coach Fickle is at a youth wrestling camp right now. Is that right, Coach? <laughs> well, I just left. I left this. I, I did. I took my boys um, to a camp from nine to two. And then uh, I, I bowled it back over here to, to, to do this and to wrap up a few things. So um, awesome. that's the joy of my life. I get to go spend four or five hours with, with the youth wrestling. That's, that's like people are like, are you taking a, you going away for your last week off or your last few days? All the coaches are out. I'm like, no, I'm going to go spend it three days at, uh, at youth wrestling camp. Cause that's my serenity. <laughs> that is awesome. And, and like you said, once it starts, it's probably nonstop all the way through to the end. And that's my first question is how do you organize like your mornings to get things going when you have such a crazy day? Is there anything you do every day? That's a non-negotiable for you. Every day in the weight room, five 30 season starts. It'll be probably five 30, six o'clock in, uh, in the summer, um, six 15, something like that. But every, every day, uh, I'm going to get my workout. And, uh, and then that's like what, what I'd say, making my bed. I don't make my bed. <laughs> <laughs> good but my wife probably does have to do that but um every morning that's going to get the day off the right way uh if i don't then then uh, it won't be good it's so funny you say that about making the bed when i was uh, a single man i listened to that video i think it's admiral mcraven and he's like start your day by making your bed and i never missed and i would get so upset with my colleagues when they tell me they couldn't do that because their significant other slept in now that I'm engaged, coach, now that my fiance lives with me, she sleeps in and the bed's never made. <laughs> well, I, I, I did. I used that uh, two years ago for our team. Make your bed by Admiral McRaven, uh, William. And, yes. and and I told everybody, it's, it's it's not make your bed. That doesn't have to be the first, like, that might not be your thing. It's how do you get your day started right? And for me, you know, I, I, I could say that made my wife, no, nah, she sometimes teaches a class at six and she's gone at five. So I can't use that excuse that she's in there. Um, but it's in my mind is how do you get your day going to make sure it's going to be a good day? And, uh, so that's why I, I use that one for, for our kids. 
They, you got to have something every day that's going to start your day. As Coach Trussell would say, it's the rudder of the day. It's going to get you going in the right direction. And when you're during peak season, I, what time are you even getting home? Is it just nonstop for you guys? It, it is. I, I think that uh, I hope to believe that we're not, uh, you know, out of control. I, I'd say, you know, the Sunday through through Wednesday is, is the later night. So, you know, hopefully you get out of here by 10 o'clock, um, you know, but, but then your Thursdays and Fridays and Friday if you're traveling, but you know, you're getting hopefully out of here at a decent hour, five, six o'clock, but it, it is, it's, you, you understand that you're on your long days. They're, they're, we don't stay till two in the morning or do that. I don't think that that's a healthy. I don't think that you can have the energy you need to have for your kids in the, the following day. Um, but uh, we're pretty consistent. <laughs> and, that was uh, not uncommon right back in the day, the 2 a.m.? Like during no, the not me. I, I've never been with anybody that's really done that. Um, I've heard stories of a lot of people that they're, you know, you, now you you can you can get some of those short weeks. So if you, if you happen to have a Friday night game, you're you're Sunday Monday. You're gonna you're gonna be late because you're trying to cram all your extra stuff into a, into one day, and it's not cramming for your kids, but all your breakdown stuff. So, um, you know, we try to be pretty consistent, and, and I try to kick them out to make sure they're, you know. They're not going to be wore out for the next day. That is just a incredible level of dedication. And when you look through, when you look through all your players, you mentioned sometimes you have some wrestlers, sometimes not. One of the biggest frustrations as a wrestling fan is to hear that, you know, a great wrestler he's not wrestling because his football coach doesn't not going to let him. And everyone in you know that's wrestled, that's involved with football knows the benefits. But you know, the second to last question, coach, is just. What's your message to, to football coaches on why wrestlers uh, have such a strong impact on the football team? That could be farther. I mean, I get more calls maybe even to talk to people about that than, than probably anything. And, and I think that the, the, the football wrestling thing goes so hand in hand. I, I think that we can have some of those, you know, football coaches that, that are, you know, I'd say unaware that they think that everybody cuts weight. And I don't want my guy losing weight. And, he's not in the weight room and and the realities are every wrestling program has evolved from maybe when I was in school and we didn't do a whole lot of lifting in high school to they work out, they lift, uh, they're going to treat their bodies the best way. Um, they're not, you know, everybody cutting weight. So I think it's such a misconception by football coaches if they don't realize and recognize the benefit because the benefits far outweigh anything else that you can do. And, just the, you know, obviously the mental toughness to what it is that you're doing, you know, the balance and, and the, you know, the leverage is so key. I think the thing that I don't hear people talk about as much as I think the greatest thing it got, it taught me and I wanted to teach my kids is core strength. There's mm-hmm. nothing that at a young age is going to develop your core strength than wrestling. And I don't care how much you lift weights when you get to junior high and this, that, and the other thing. Those guys that have, you know, wrestled at a younger age and just the torque and twist, the core strength that is so critical uh, as you move up and, and play in other sports, especially football, uh, it's not something that you can all of a sudden start building in high school. Yeah, and, and I hear a lot of people in the wrestling world take it one step before that and say before they put their kids in wrestling, they put them in gymnastics for that same reason, which that was unheard of even 15 years ago when I was going through high school. So it's it's it all kind of parallels one another, but – Take that to note, football coaches. Uh, us big, yeah, us bigger kids have a hard time going into gymnastics. <laughs> <laughs> My daughter did it. It was the greatest thing. My boys, they couldn't even – it started off that, – that was they couldn't do it very well at that <laughs> stuff. Uh, so I, uh, but I do. Uh, some of the uh, – little, I, I think it's a great correlation. Um, just that core strength. Yeah. And, uh, man, it's so, it's so cool to hear someone who's at the highest level saying that because like we've known it for years and it's just, it's just awesome. It's only going to help grow wrestling, which is obviously the goal here. You know, one of the last things I wanted to ask you about coaches, I've heard you say that one of your most memorable wins was the UCLA game, your second year outside of the result, which obviously you guys won. Why is that one that sticks out so big for you in, in, in all the games you've won? Well, you, you kind of asked in, you kind of said it about, you know, changing the environment and the culture and, and from year one to year two, you know, we, we, I, we recognized a, a lot of the things that we didn't do, 
you know, I told you we were just focusing on competitive spirit and who's going to compete, who's going to grind every day. And, you know, we, we, we missed out on a lot of things about, you know, making sure our team understood what it took to, to be successful. And so we, we kind of switched gears and not that we still didn't compete, not that we still didn't grind, but you know, this whole idea that, look, we, we're going to do some things different. We're going to do things together. We're going to focus on this. Um, I being a conservative guy, I grew up, you know, I would say under coach Trestle and he would say the most important playing football is punting, you know, and the, the way the world has evolved and, and football's evolved a little bit. So I had to kind of get out of my shell a little bit and say, as a defensive guy, you know, I, I play the conservative style of football and, you know, so I said, I need to make some changes. So we went into camp and said, we're going to do these things more aggressively and we're going to take chances and which was out of kind of characteristic of me. So the UCLA game, obviously not just a big win on the road in year, in year two, but the way that which we won it. You know, in the last drive, we had a chance to kick a field goal to go up, I think, by seven. But we decided, no, we were up by four as it was. We were going to try to close it out. And we, on that last drive, went for it on fourth down three times and got it. Went wow. for it on fourth and goal from one yard and got it. And that's why I say things fell in line, that we were preaching this, which you know, you can't preach one thing and then go out and do another. So we had preached it and preached it. And it, and it just, the message, all of a sudden we took the chances, we took the chances, we took the chances and they were successful. And then we win a big game like that, close it out, win by, you know, whatever it was, 10 or 12 points. Uh, and the way that which it, we did it, that locker room was so much different. You know, the trust, respect, and love you saw for the first time inside that locker room. And then the belief, about how you won the game and what you were trying to change. Um, all those kind of things kind of fell on the line and, and uh, it just helped us grow. And, and from there, the, you know, I think the momentum and energy really started to, to shift and build um, into that team and a lot of the things we were doing. That is so cool. And, you know, your culture's huge on team. I, I think the, uh, the motto is together, everyone wins. And that that's just so clear when you, when you watch your, Watch your guys out there. Coach, we'll sign off with this. This podcast is called Wrestling Changed My Life. How did wrestling impact or or change your life even to this day? Well, it, it taught me so much. Um, I know for a fact that, that uh, I would not be where I am in, in several playing football and you know, have an opportunity to play at the next level had I not been a wrestler. Uh, just the things that taught me, um, the lessons I learned, the strength I built, because I wasn't naturally, you know, one of those really, really strong guys with natural power. So you got to, you know, play with greater leverage and, you know, have a greater core strength. So it started maybe there. Um, but I think just the, the idea of how tough mentally, physically, and emotionally it is, um, gets me through every situation. And, uh, you know, being able to fail at a young age uh, in a in something that uh, I thought was, you know, what I wanted to do. Meaning, I mean, I had this goal and dream at a young age and then to fail doing it and then realize and recognize at age of 14 how you got to keep pushing and moving forward. Uh, all that was done in wrestling. You know, I talked about wanting to win a four times went to win a state championship four times when I was in kindergarten and then you lose as a freshman. That was probably the big, one of the biggest moments of my, you know, things I remember today. And, and one of the things that shaped me more than anything, but it taught me how to fall forward. And I think it's, it's tough if you don't, you know, even at a young age, get to some of those high levels where you put a lot of pressure and stress on yourself and then learn how to fail and keep going. And, uh, there's nothing that taught me that like wrestling because you can do it as a team. You can lose in a football game in the little league and 10 minutes later, it's, it, it is what it is. And, you know, cause you got your buddies, you got your teammates around you, but when you lose an individual sport, especially when you try to p perform at a level, you know, that you want to, um, and you put a lot of stress and pressure and a lot of work into it, uh, it, it, it can, you know, it can be really crushing and, uh, learning how at uh, 14 or 15 to, to continue to move forward with that um, has made me and shaped me and, and helped me through every other situation, uh, even at 48. 
Is that the is that the Perrysburg loss that you're referencing? The gentleman from Perrysburg? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, well, I lost the guy from Faustoria in the semis and then lost to Perrysburg in the wrestleback and, and uh we'll never go in that school and never forget that. <laughs> that is so funny that of all the experiences you've had in sports, that one sticks with you. But I mean at the time though, like to a high schooler, there's nothing there's nothing uh bigger or more impactful than you know, the state tournament, you know, nothing could be bigger and, and to, to have that ripped away. And you probably thought you'd put everything into it to get there. And then to have to rebuild from ground zero is like, it's uh it hurts at the time, but blessing in disguise. There's no doubt. I, I, I often look back at that and said, well, you know, guy I beat twice, won the state maybe, but had it been different, would I really be who I am? Would I really be as motivated? Um, you know, and what I have understood how to fail and get back up and fall forward, uh, you know, at such a critical, you know, time. Yeah. Well, it's, it's been cool to hear you talk about some of these stories and, you know, just a, a real honor to have you on the show, especially as you guys head into your camp, we're going to be rooting for you here from Chicago and just want to th- again, say thanks for coming on coach. Anytime. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm always listening. Thanks for tuning into Wrestling Changed My Life and listening to this episode with Coach Luke Fickle. To support the show, go to SpartanCombat.com and place your custom team apparel order for the 2022-2023 season. We'll be back on Wednesday with a new episode. And in the meantime, go to WrestlingChangeMyLife.com to check out all past episodes. We'll see you next time.